it's all I could do to stay in my seat. That was so wonderful. Thank you, Lisa. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome to Main Street United Methodist Church. Those of you who are here visiting with us in the sanctuary and those who are watching online. <clears throat> and welcome to all of our guests this morning. We're glad to see so many of you here. <clears throat> Let's look at some announcements. Um, <clears throat> there are always so many on our prayer list, and please keep those people in mind throughout the week. Birthdays, uh, the 22nd is Chris Smith, and the 25th is Judith McGee. And Chris and Leanne also have an anniversary then on the 24th, and that's 17 years. <clears throat> please sign the greeting cards that are in the narthex, and they are for Pat Leslie, Pauline Pruitt, and Sarah Lear. We have a couple of thank yous in the bulletin this morning from the Boyd family and also from Janet Shipley. So take a minute to read those, and they both are very appreciative of this congregation. Also, uh, the men are preparing for the retired teachers luncheon that's coming up at the end of September. And for you men who had planned to help pick the chickens, forget it. David already got it done, so you won't need to debone the chickens. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> but they are planning to uh, make uh, ham loaves. If you are interested in helping make ham loaves, that's on the 27th. That's a, a Tuesday at 9 a.m. And if you can help with that, let Dave or Phil Drake know. <clears throat> they would appreciate your help. There will not be um, prayers and conversations this Wednesday afternoon with Pastor Julia because of the uh, memorial service for Andy Klein's mother. And there is uh, an announcement about Charity Circle. We're meeting on uh, Wednesday, September the 4th, and we plan to have a shower for the Living Alternative Pregnancy Resource Center. We would like to invite all members who would like to donate to this cause to please bring a baby item for this shower. There are some things listed in the bulletin, and if you do not plan to come to the meeting, you can leave some things in the office. There will be a box there for baby items. <clears throat> and also, this was in the bulletin last Sunday, but I just wanted to remind all of you again about the gospel concert that is tonight at the Nazarene Church at 6 o'clock. This is a fundraiser for Samaritan caregivers. And if you enjoy gospel music, you will dearly love this program. They have some local talent, but Matt Gerhardt brought in a gentleman from Nashville, Tennessee. And um, if you've got a few minutes, you might go out online and check him out. He's wonderfully talented. So. It would probably only be about an hour and a half of your time, and it is at 6 o'clock at the Nazarene Church. Okay. I'll let you and, um, introduce Jeff Newton. That'll be later. Okay. <clears throat> I believe that is all of the announcements that I can see. So let's uh, pass the peace. Peace be with you. And also with you. Please share the peace of God. Oh, how are you? Our opening hymn is, This Is My Father's World, page 144. Please return to your seats. You'll have time to greet later.
Well, good morning, everyone, and I'll repeat, as Marge said earlier, welcome to Main Street United Methodist. I'm Pastor Julia, and it is such a joy to be worshiping with you this morning. And now I invite you to join together in our opening prayer. Give us, Lord, a little sun, a little happiness, and some work. Give us a heart to comfort those in pain. Give us the ability to be good, strong, wise, and free, so that we may be as generous with others as we are with ourselves. Finally, Lord, let us all live as your own one family. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated as we continue in worship with a lesson from the Old Testament. The Old Testament this morning is found in Psalms 25, verses 4 through 11. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Teach it to me, because you are the God who saves me. I put my hope in you all day long. Lord, remember your compassion and faithful love. They are forever. But don't remember the sins of my youth or my wrongdoing. Remember me only according to your faithful love for the sake of your goodness, Lord. The Lord is good and does the right thing. He teaches sinners which way they should go. God guides the weak to justice, teaching them his way. All the Lord's paths are loving and faithful for those who keep his covenant and laws. Please, for the sake of your good name, Lord, forgive my sins, which are many. Holy words, holy wisdom. Our reflection song is an old familiar hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, page 526 in your hymnal. Mm -hmm.
As we continue in our worship, we move now, we continue to move into a time of prayer where we can bring our joys and our concerns, not just for ourselves, but for our families and our friends, our communities, our neighbors, to bring them to the feet of Jesus and leave them there knowing that he does care. I would remind you that there have been several prayer requests in the church lately, and we do have several people who have had friends going through extreme difficulties in the past week. So let us be praying for one another, lifting each other up, even as we look ahead to the future with joy and remain hopeful. I will lead us in a, t a short uh, prayer, and then I'll invite you to a time of silent prayer where you can lift your own joys and concerns, and then we will finish together saying the Lord's Prayer. But let us go to the Lord. Let us pray. Holy and almighty God, great is your goodness, great is your love and compassion. We know that there are times of struggle where we are not able to see the friends around us, where we can have times where things are hidden and mysterious, where it feels like you're far away. We know that there is pain in this world, Lord, that there is suffering and hardship. But may we also remember, God, that you are the giver of every good thing and that for every sorrow there is joy to be found. With every storm there is still yet a bit of silver lining. Lord, we acknowledge the pain, but may we also acknowledge the hope that can be found in your Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, while we find yet comfort in prayers spoken, in prayers heard, in prayers that are silent from our hearts, may we also find comfort in praying the words that your Son taught us to pray together as one people. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. There's a short lesson from the Gospel of Mark this morning, uh, chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. I believe it might be familiar to a few folks, and it seemed very appropriate to be reminded of these words this morning. So from Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. People were bringing children to Jesus so that he would bless them. But the disciples scolded them. And when Jesus saw this, he grew angry and said to them, Allow the children to come to me. Don't forbid them, because God's kingdom belongs to people like these children. I assure you that whoever doesn't welcome God's kingdom like a child will never enter it. And then he hugged the children and blessed them. This is the gospel of the risen Christ. Thanks be to God. And now I will turn it over to the founder and current executive of Kokomo Urban Outreach. He is our special guest today, and it is such a joy to hear him share the word. Please welcome uh, Reverend Jeff Newton. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. It's great to be here today. You all get, uh, isn't it great to be here today? It's, it's better to be here than somewhere else, I think. It's good. It's good. Today's a good day. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you all. Uh, we have many thanks today, many people to thank, but I want to thank you for allowing us to be here today and to share your, this time with all of you. 
Um, one of the ways that we started Kokomo Urban Outreach, when we start the UP program every single time we gather together, pretty much every time, so we start with something called the Creed. Now, I know you don't have the Creed in front of you, nor not on the screen, but I'm just going to say it to you so you know how we start. Okay, I think I have it memorized, I hope, because if I do, I get 50 points. <laughs> I am respectful at home, at school, at work, and to myself. I'm responsible for my actions, for caring for myself, for listening and learning, and for the way I treat others. I'm reliable by being on time, by keeping my promises, by finishing what I start, and by being persistent. I'm ready to work, to lead, to speak up, and to solve problems in a positive way. That's the way we start every time. And that's the way we expect kids to behave and to act. And uh, we're, we're not only, do, we're not only is those the is that taught in the, in the actual meetings and everything we do, it's actually taught in many schools as well. So if you go to Petta Park, for example, that's how they start their day. Um, same thing with Elwood Haynes and some of the classes at Elwood Haynes. So um, before I actually get started and talk a little bit more what I want to talk about, I want to, I want to introduce a few people that are with us today. First of all, we have some board members here. We have Gene Cristiva here, he's there. We have Kelly Barker. I saw Kelly Barker somewhere, way back there. Oh, but this is, I'm not used to this far away. This is like echoey. And then back there is Roxanne Cronk. So we have three board members here today. We have our staff is here. We have um, Kareen Duns back there, back in the back row. We have Deanna Ansel. We have um, Morgan Odom there. We have, I think that's all that's in here now. Some of them are getting some more stuff for the block party. Oh, we have Tina. I almost missed Tina. She's, she's, she's shrinking away to nothing. So Tina. Um, so Tina, uh, Tina, who is Kareen's mother, is with us as well. And then we have some people that are, that are like staff members that volunteer so much that they feel like staff members. So we have, we have uh, Joanne Harmon's with us. Again, Jean is a big volunteer with us all the time. And Tom Cronk. I saw him here. And so... Just to let you all know, kind of, I don't, did I forget anybody? Hope not. <laughs> so, so just to kind of let you kind of know where we are in this process, because I know that you as a church are, have the same kind of uh, anticipation that we have at the outreach. We, we've been waiting on this uh, deal to go through for about a year and a half. It takes a long time, longer than I thought it would, but it's taken a while, so we, we're just being patient with the process, right? So we're patient with the process. But in those 18 months, we have at the outreach, we have, a, we, have a, um, we have been busy doing things. For example, we, we know when we move here to this building, we're going to scale up. We're going to have many more kids than we have now. So we're making those plans of how that's going to happen. And part of that planning time was to pull together a bunch of community members to form a task force to help us to figure out if we could do it financially, uh, what we're going to need to do, just a whole bunch of policies, procedures, all kinds of things we put together. And Amy Beachy's here. She's one of the consultants on that project with Kim, Kim Pickerton. So, so we've been working on that. We're working on a strategic plan, working on building plans, working with construction folks. We're trying to get it all together. We've had an inspection, a phase one inspection to check for hazardous materials, which all came out good. So we're in that process. And we're trying to do all the, all the behind the scenes things as quickly as we can so that when we finally get the final agreement, we'll be ready to go. But, we're, but, having said that, we're not going to move in like two days after we get the agreement. It's going to take a long time. We're not going to, I just want to assure the congregation here, it's going to take a while before we ever get here because we want to do things correctly. We have some things we want to modify a little bit. And today, after the service, um, if you would like to take a vision tour with me, I will show you your own church, but I'll show you what we envision in parts of it um, to, to make some changes. And then um, if you're in Sunday school, I'll do a second one after that as well. So I'll do two because there might be bigger groups. So I'll do a second one after that. So we'll just walk you through the building and kind of show you what we're going to do with different rooms and our plans. And again, none of this is in stone. It's zero in stone. First of all, we don't have a purchase agreement yet. So we're, <laughs> it's nothing in stone. And then we have to have a building committee. And there's a whole bunch of capital funds campaign. How much can we raise? So nothing's in stone. But we want to give you a vision of what we're thinking at least now, and then you all, we're all on the same page that way. How's that sound to everybody? Yeah. Does that sound okay? All right, having said all that, I want to just explain a little bit about wh how we got to, not to the building part, but how we get at Cocoa Urban Outreach where we are today. 20 years ago, not quite 20 years ago, that's a little exaggeration, it's been like 19, 18, 19. It's getting close to 20 years ago. 
I came to Kokomo, uh, moved back to Kokomo as a United Methodist pastor um, to Trinity United Methodist Church over by Garden Square, Gateway Gardens. And my goal was to start a ministry that would meet needs of people around us. And for 10 years, we did that. We had food pantries, and we have a... Um, I know her name. My mind just... Have you ever had this problem where your mind goes like... What? Lisa! Lisa, I got it. See, I got it real fast. Lisa, Lisa was part of that group of the original food pantries. She did a great job interviewing people, talking to folks. And so at the beginning, we had food pantries. We had clothing giveaways. We had uh, Christmas giveaways. We did a Christmas Day sack lunch here at this church on Christmas Day. Made hundreds of sack lunches and delivered them all over the place. Passed out Christmas for all kinds of things. We gave away lots and lots of things. After 10 years of doing that, I began to um, see the older kids in the families that we started out helping as teenagers come back as adults with their kids. They were asking for the same things. I was disturbed by that. I realized that we maybe weren't helping people. We were helping them get through poverty, but not out. And I, as I prayed about it, I prayed about it one day, I was praying about it, and I, was, um, I found myself on a cruise ship in my head. I found myself on a cruise ship. If you've been on a cruise ship before, you know a cruise ship has everything. Everything you ever could think of is on a cruise ship. And I could see people down in the water, just treading water, trying to keep their head above the water, struggling, struggling, struggling to keep their head above the water. And I'd yell down and say, hey, what do you need? And they would yell back up, we need food, we need clothes, we need get gas cards, we need whatever they needed. And whatever they needed, we threw it to them. We, they got it. We just threw it to them. And so I kept that in my head. A couple weeks later, I was praying again. This time I was led to Matthew 25. And you all know Matthew 25, where Jesus says, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, you know, all that, all that. I said, God, that's what we're doing. Why doesn't it feel good? Why isn't this working out for me? Why is it, why, what's, what's the thought? Why, why, why am I so unsettled? And then I was led to Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, where Jesus says, when you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. I just kind of kept that in my head. When you do the least of these, you do it to me. That's the scripture passage for the day. So there is scripture here. If you do the least of these, you do it to me. And so I, I kept that in my head. And then a couple of weeks later, I was praying again. And I found myself back on the cruise ship. And I saw the people treading water. And I yelled down to the first person. I said, hey, what do you need? They looked up and I saw the face of Jesus. And I knew that I would never throw Jesus anything. I would try to pull Jesus out. That's different. Because you try to help to pull, when you're trying to pull somebody out of difficult things that they're struggling in, when you try to help pull them out, you have to get to know them. It's just not handing them a bag of food and saying, go be well. And we did make some modifications right before we actually closed the pantry, a few months before we closed the pantry, maybe a year before. We were actually talking with people and trying to get to know them and all that. And then our funding went dry. So that was just a sign from God that we need to stop. I hate to stop because we lost some great volunteers like Lisa. We lost some great volunteers. She was there every single week. But, she, but, but after a period of time, they all understood. They all understood the new direction, the new way of going. We started with adults. We started working with, I started working with adults, trying to train them. And she said, one of the things that I was learning, hearing, I heard from people a lot. I don't know if you've ever heard this before. Have you heard before? Uh, teach a person, give a person a fish to eat for a day, teach a person a fish to eat for a lifetime. But well, as I was talking to adults that were struggling, I, I found out that they were, um, they knew how to fish, they just couldn't get to the ponds. They didn't know how to get to the ponds where the fish were. And, and, and I, I realized at that point, at that point in time, reading Toxic Charity, a book called Toxic Charity, other things, I realized at that point in time, that the last thing people really need to get out of poverty, you know, to get through they need it, but to get out of poverty, the last thing people need is another pair of used blue jeans and a giant can of ravioli. That doesn't get anybody out. That gets them through. It holds them where they are. It makes the givers feel good. We're doing something. At least we're doing something. And again, I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with that. That's just not what I was geared to do. I wanted to make sure that people were raised up and out. We started by working with adults. And actually what happened was, remember the tornado of 2016? Came right through where we, we were, hit Garden Square. It was a big mess. And I was asking people, um, 
they were coming over to the building to eat because there was no power in the apartments. And as they were eating with us, I would say, so what's your biggest need now? And most of them were saying, I lost my hours at work because my work has no power or my work's not open. My, there's a tree on my car. I'm not working and my rent's getting ready to be due and my bills have to be paid and my check's going to be short. So in the past, what I would have done is I'd have called churches up and say, hey, we need some help and they would send us money. And then I would sit them down and say, how many hours did you lose and, and how much do you make an hour? And I would just give them that, that sign off on paper and I would give them that money and send them on. This time I didn't do that. This time I said, you can, work with, you can work for us at $10 an hour. This was in 2016. Um, $10 an hour. And you can work up to 50 hours and make $500 because if you get to 600 you have to be on our payroll. So you can get $500. But you have to be here at 9 o'clock in the morning sharp. We had a big group of people doing that. And what we did was we gave them chainsaws, brooms, rakes, all kinds of things. They began to clean up the neighborhood. They began to clean up the apartment, pick up things. Clean it all up. And we paid them, and they recovered their hours. Well, in the middle of that, there was a handful of people that, that looked like they were doing a great job. And I talked to one of them, a, a guy, and I asked him, I said, if you could do anything in the world, what would you do? He said, I would take boys off the street, and I would teach them how to work. We had money left over from, the, from that tornado fund that we had, and I said, let's try that. So the, this, uh, this guy uh, recruited three kids to come to a huddle. We call it Huddle on Wednesday call it a huddle, uh, as a meeting, and then they were going to go out and work on Thursday. There was only three of them. So the first guy, he recruited the week before, the first guy tried to rob his marijuana dealer in an alley, and the marijuana dealer shot and killed him. The first, the first person that signed up at the time, we called it Man Up, uh, signed up for Man Up was shot and killed before he ever got there. The next two got there, they were both 14, and the one 14-year-old came in crying. And the director at the time said, what's wrong? And he said, um, my girlfriend just had a miscarriage today. And we realized we were working with kids that struggled with a lot of things. At least I did. And we thought we'd have 30 kids at the end of a year. We had 30 kids at the end of a month. And then um, it kept building and building. Um, and then in February, that was in November of 2016. In February 2016, Deanna was helping me all along the way. She was, she's great at disaster relief. She, she's coordinated two tornadoes and a flood, helping people. Amazing. She could do, she could do multiple, multiple things at once um, and does it pretty well, really well. <laughs> Just kidding. Really well. She does a great job. But then uh, Kareen, uh, I, I received a phone call from a, a parole officer, probation officer. And he said, we have a, a young man here that's on house arrest. He's been in prison. He's on house arrest. And he's married, and his wife works at Chrysler. And he doesn't, he doesn't have a job. He's not working. He's just staying at home. And he needs to get back out in the community and do something. And so he said, would you let him come and volunteer and do community service? I said, well, I need to talk with him. So Kareen comes to my office, and we're sitting there talking. He just got out. He's been out of prison for about a year or two. He's on house arrest. It was a violent crime. It was, um, he's never ever had a job. He's never had a job that, that paid, that was legal. He, on paper, it looked all bad. Why would I want to bring this guy in and help, have him work at at risk, with at risk kids? But I pray. And my goal, my goal has always been we need to make longer tables and shorter fences. And so I thought, well, if I, I was praying about it, and as I was sitting there, because I didn't know what to do exactly, and I felt the Holy Spirit say, take him. Give him a chance. So I made the table longer. I said, Kareen, come and have a seat with our family. So Kareen sat down with our family. He volunteered at the beginning. He was a volunteer. He, uh, he, really didn't, he told me he didn't really want to be there. He he had just been out of prison with a whole bunch of guys. He didn't want to be around a bunch of more boys. Uh, he would sit in the huddle, and we had it in the sanctuary. He would sit in the huddle in the back with the boys, and they didn't even know he was an adult. They just thought he was one of them. He just basically sat there. He was mostly on his phone, to be honest. I could see him on his phone, and I thought, well, he's never going to make it, but we'll try him. And then over time, there was a guy, a kid that came in and said he was going to rob a jewelry store. 
And Creed told him, if you do that, you're going to go to jail. He goes, I know I'm too smart for that. Well, the kid was gone for two weeks. He'd been in jail because he did it, got caught. It's on camera. And so having said all that, uh, Creed at that time, he said that's when things clicked for him. And now today, he's the program director of Kokomo Urban Outreach. He goes into schools. He's a, he's a person that goes into schools and uh, helps kids, either try to keep kids in school if they're in tr- when they get in trouble. He helps with the principals, he helps the administrators, and he works with all the kids in the programs across, across the way. Having said that, he, um, when he came in, and he was working in the schools then as well, and he, at the end of a school year, he said, school's out, what are we going to do now? Because it's summertime. What am I going to do all day? I said, what do you want to do? And he said, can you take me to school? Because, you know, he, he's, and he is an open book. He, if he was standing here, he would tell you the same thing. So I'm not gossiping. I'm not saying anything that he would not say to you personally. But when he, he said, I can't read very well. And he never had read out, you know, out loud in front of anybody ever. When he, he said he, when he was in school, when they had the reading circles, right before it got about two before him, he would um, uh, act up so he'd get kicked out of the class so he wouldn't have to read. And then he, um, and then one time we were at, we were at Kokomo High School recruiting kids. We don't recruit kids anymore because we can't really take anymore. We could take them all just one by one, but not a big group. And so we, we, we was at Kokomo High School recruiting kids, and he was there recruiting, and along comes Miss Barker, his teacher. He, it was his teacher at the time. At that time, she was the principal, vice principal at high, the high school. She had Creed in school, and she would come to his house and pull him out of bed to get him to school. And she did that a lot. So she knew him. She knew him. And she um, had built a relationship, and then she started helping. And it's just, it's just a long story. If I had all day, I could tell you lots of stories. But it was, it was a long story. To make a long story shorter, uh, um, he, she began to help us and help him. And things began to go really well. He, uh, so he, he went to school. I took him to school. We, and him and the other guy, we went to school. We began to have vocabulary words, lots of vocabulary words, began to read. He was reading. He realized how important reading is. He, he makes sure kids can read and helps them to read. Uh, about oh, six months ago, six or eight months ago, he, I, was re- I, I wasn't working at that time. I was off, kind of on a little sabbatical, I guess. And um, he said, well, let's have lunch. I said, I can have lunch anytime I'm free. I said, what do you want to do? Because I don't know. You have to call Deanna. I had to make an appointment to have lunch with him. It took, it, it took me two weeks to get it. And we had lunch. And when he comes out, he says, to the lunch, he says, let's write a book, a children's book. I said, okay. So we wrote a children's book. So it's called The Talking Toolbox. It's the four R's, respectful, responsible, reliable, ready. His picture is right there. So he, uh, he and I wrote, wrote a children's book, and we're, we're working on it. We take it to classrooms. We distribute it through classrooms. So, and, um, so there it is. So we have, we, he's written a book. Having said all that, he and Deanna uh, and the rest of the staff um, manage the program, and they do a great job. So basically, here's the way it works really quickly. It works like this. They're, the older kids are 10 years old to 18. And it's called up. After, after COVID, we, we had a girls' program and a boys' program. We combined them because of sanit- we had, they said we had to sanitize certain ways and do certain things. So we put them together to make it easier. So instead of um, man up, it's called up. And up stands for, we believe there's unlimited potential in every kid. But what we do is we unleash the potential in them. We try to turn the invisible things inside of them into visible things that they know they can do. And so every kid, every kid in the older program comes to a huddle. And we're excited to have this room. We're going to be doing the huddle here in this room on Wednesday nights. Um, right now, there's about 100, just 110 to 150. It varies. Sitting on folded chairs in a little tiny space that probably shouldn't have more than 100 in it, if that. And, that, and uh, Korean leads the huddle. And, then, and, they, and they receive points. They receive five, five points for that. And that's a mentoring time. So we're talking about things like depression and mental, mental health. Um, they're talking about um, safety. They're talking about all kinds of things, issues, bullying, all kinds of issues, things. And it's a, it's a mentoring time for the whole group. It's group mentoring time. And then after that, they come to work for two hours a week. Either work on Thursday, Friday, or Monday. 
and they get paid 20 points for that. So we have some different work groups. The biggest work group is, is, what we, is the landscaping group that we come to be, go to people's houses and we rake leaves or we lay mulch or we pull weeds or we clean first floor gutters. Um, just whatever a 10 to 18 year old could do around the house. And we can bring lots of kids. We can rake an acre yard in, a, in less than an hour with 30 kids. And then you give a donation. So that's that one. And then we have something called Up Creations where uh, kids meet and they make home decor, t-shirts, wreaths, all kinds of things. They make them and then they sell them at the farmer's market and craft shows. So there's a group that does that. There's another group, and we have a couple of kids in that one that's here. I saw back there. We have a wood shop where they make, um, they've made some dog accessories. They've made cornhole games. They've made some chairs. They, they make things and they sell those. Planters is what they're doing right now, planter. And they sell those, they sell those as well. We have something called an urban farm where we have a, we're growing vegetables for the Yoke restaurant specific to what they need. And we're getting ready to bake cookies for the um, Gravity Trampoline where we'll bake cookies for them and they'll sell them and then we get, they're gonna give us the whole amount. Whatever they sell them for, we're gonna get the whole amount. So that's gonna be cool. So kids learn how to, how to, how to work and how to do things. Those are our work areas. That's all part of the UP program. It's, it's not different programs, it's all one thing. And so they work and they earn the points. And so when they get their points, we have a store, and in the store there's hygiene supplies, there's clothing, there's food, and then there's snacks. So all the snacks are one point, the clothing is one point, the hygiene is two things for one point, and the food is two things for one point. Sometimes, when we had the food pantry, you know, we gave away lots of food. Now we're giving away lots of food again, because kids are coming in and they're buying sometimes a week's worth of groceries off the shelf for their family. But nothing's free. That's our, that's our thing. Nothing is free. Everything, you pay for everything, just like real life. We have, we have washers and dryers. They can do their laundry for one point. Um, and, and then um, we had a kid that went into the store the other day. And he, was, he, had, he had a bunch of candy. He said, oh, I'm going to put some of this back because there's a five-point limit. He said, if you buy food, there's no limit on that. So he puts it back, he said, we really need some toilet paper in our house, so I'm gonna buy stuff for my family. He put the candy back and bought the, bought the bathroom tissue instead. And that's the way kids begin to think. They begin to think, how are we gonna do this? Some, a lot of kids pay for their own cell phones. If they earn in increments of 50, they can get gift cards. So you get a $50 gift card, a $100 gift card, however many points you save for. And we've had, we have a kid, right, we have two kids. We have a girl that saved 1,600 points, that's $1,600. We have an 11-year-old boy that saved 1,300 points. That's $1,300. We had a boy a few years ago that saved for a car. He bought a car. So, um, so you can save and accumulate and work and do all those things. And that's how it works. And so kids are working and learning. And so our, our mission, is three, three-pronged three mission, is to teach work ethics, teach life skills. So in the wintertime, we can't go out to work. We teach life skill classes, how to cook, how to how to do dishes, how to do laundry, how to budget, how to read labels, the food groups, how to use tools, how to, how to make things with tools, car repair, oil changes, all kinds of things, basic home repairs. We do all that, and they, they, they gain life skills. And so if you have work ethics plus life skills, and then the third part, this is the, probably the most important part, is education. So every parent signs off on the back of their uh, application saying we have permission to interact with the school. We can interact with the principals, the teachers. We can tell if they're absent or tardy. If they get in trouble, we know. We can check on their power school. We can check their grades. So we're tracking their grades. We're trying to keep them on goal. Every kid has a different goal. Not every kid's going to be a straight-A student. But if we can get the Fs to Cs, we're, we're doing something. If we can get them in school every single day, that's an accomplishment. So we've, we set goals for them, and we help them achieve their educational goals. So we have work ethics plus life skills. Plus, it's kind of a math equation if you like math. Work ethics plus life skills plus education equals a self-reliant adult. And that's what you want to be. And that's our goal. We believe we can stop generational poverty in its tracks. But in order to, do, in order to have a bigger effect on Kokomo, to create good citizens by teaching the four R's, we have to expand. We have to get bigger. And we know that. And it costs a lot of money. And so, so we're working on all that. That's what we're working with Amy and Kim. Um, working on how that all is going to come together. Um, 
So, so that was the older kids. The older kids have been going for since 2016. But one day, Karina and I were driving to Logan Sport to do something. I forget exactly what we were doing. We were going to Logan Sport in the car. And he said, we need to get kids earlier. We're getting them way too late. By the time they're 10 to 18 years old, that's way too late. And by the time they're too late, uh, they're already in trouble with the law. And their school's a mess. And so we've got to get them sooner. So we started at the time, it was called Mini Man Up. And we took kids under the age of nine. And they did the same thing the older kids did, except in 20 minute in intervals. And um, it started as a man up, mini man up. About the fourth week, there was a little group, and, and in, the mini, in, in mini man up, there was a meal. So we, we always had a meal to kind of teach table manners and all that kind of thing. And so um, there was a girl sitting out in the curb across the street at Gateway. And she asked Karina if she could come in because her brother got to eat dinner tonight, and she didn't. So Karina comes rushing in and says, we've got to get, let her in. I said, no, we can't because we don't have any permission from her parents and if her mom, and if her mom come, can't find her, then we're in trouble. We have to have this, this sign thing. So he took food right out to the curb, and she ate on the outside. The next week, we brought in girls. And now it's not many man up, it's just many up. And we work with the three, four, and five-year-olds. We have a bunch of kindergarten teachers who get off of school and then come in at five o'clock on every Tuesday and volunteer. And they are helping those four, three, four, and five-year-olds get ready for kindergarten. But the, the kids believe they're working. They're coming to work, that's what they're told. They're working. So their, their jobs entails things like uh, sorting colors, counting, identifying letters, sitting in a circle quietly while a story's being read, lining up, all the different things you would need to do to get ready for kindergarten, they're getting that now. Then the older kids, the seven, the first, second, and third graders, uh, rotate between different activities. So they go to the gym, they have a meal time, they go to a huddle, just like the older kids. In that huddle, they're working on the four R's especially, and right now, uh, Roxanne and Tom and Jean run the huddle, and they're, working, they're teaching them about jobs that really don't take a college education necessarily. So they're, they're talking about plumbers and electricians and things like that. Training, but not, maybe not a four-year college thing. And then, uh, then they go to work, and their, their work includes things like they plant tulips around the building, they do all the weeding around the building, they uh, stuff envelopes for us, they make thank you notes for us, they do all kinds of things that, they, that is work, and they learn how to fold clothes, and measure flour, all kinds of things like that, too, with life skills as well. And then uh, at the end of the night, they all get paid a dollar. So if you work, you get the dollar. If you don't work, you don't get the dollar. It's just like life. And then when you go home sad, you know what happens the next week? They're all good. They're good to go. They, they, no more trouble. So that's how the program works. And when we, when we actually are able to get here in this building, we're going we're gonna to be able to add many more children. We don't even know for sure how many more. And right now, our plan, this, again, this is not in stone, but right now the thinking is we're going to keep our other building and run, run the mini up out of there. We, right now, we kind of focus on Elwood Haynes. Any kid can come, but we mostly have kids from Elwood Haynes. We kind of focus on Elwood Haynes. And other elementary schools are saying, when's our night? But we really can't take any more nights because we don't have any more nights because the older kids are there. And so we don't really have any more space. So if we bring the older kids over here, the little kids can stay there, and we can have many up every night. That will take us from about 80 to 100 kids to three to 500 kids, little kids. Over here, we have 200 kids in the older program now. That's, we could bring four to 500 over here. We could be doing close to 1,000 kids between the two once we're able to get everything situated. So having said all that, I, wanna, I, I just appreciate your prayers, and, and, I, and I want you to realize this too that when you help the, lo the least, when you do the least of these, you do it to Jesus. It's kind of like Jesus is in disguise. You don't even realize it's Jesus. All those children to me, when I see them, I see the faith of Jesus. Every one of them. Even though not every one of them acts like Jesus. I see Jesus in them. I see every one of the, those kids in the program as having high worth and are worth it. And that's why we're just not going to move them over here without thinking everything through and making sure we have it done correctly because they're worth it. 
When we hug the kids, we're hugging Jesus. When we're working with the kids, we're working with Jesus. When we have staff like Corrine come in, we can see Jesus. And so having, so with all that, I would covet your prayers. And again, if you'd like to take a vision tour with me, we'll just kind of meet back in the back. And we'll, I'll, give you, I'll kind of give you a little more information, and then we'll go. And then after Sunday school, we'll do, we'll do it with those folks if anybody wants to. And then you're all welcome to stay for the block party after that. So the kids, the kids in the program that are here right now, once, once we're done here, you guys can go out and get the block party started and set up. And then we'll be out there with you once the whole service is over, not yet, but once the whole service is over. And we just appreciate your prayers. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for allowing us to be here today. I pray that you would bless this congregation. And God, we're so thankful for the willingness to um, allow us to be here. Allow us to make the modifications we need to make the building safe for kids. We pray, Lord God, that we could all have understanding. We can all find peace in that. And I pray, Lord God, that your will would always be done. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Main Street, I believe there is a specific way we are supposed to thank those who come and speak and share such wonderful testimony. You are hard to follow. As we continue in worship, though, um, one part of our worship service does include asking for an offering. Uh, you would notice on the back of our bulletin where we show some of our year-to-date income, expenses, as well as tracking the different giving. We do have our operating expenses as well as a missions fund. So if you would feel so called to help in these funds and to help this church, and to continue to be the church, we would greatly appreciate it. But for now, uh, we invite our ushers to come forward at this time. for the, all the things that you have given us, 
and for all the ways that we seek to find your Son, we give thanks. Bless this money, bless these people as we seek to do your will, as we long to see your Son in the people around us, even past the disguises this world creates. Lord, bless our worship, and may we see your kingdom that is still to come. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. All right. Well, I would invite you to remain standing as we sing our closing song, I, uh, We Are the Church. Thank you everyone for your time here and as a reminder uh, directly after the service you have the opportunity to walk through the building and have a vision of how God might still transform this place for the betterment of Kokomo Urban Outreach, for the betterment of Main Street, for the betterment of our community. And if you're not in too much of a hurry, even after the uh, vision tour, you can stick around to enjoy a block party and celebrate together the work that God is doing and to welcome the kids back to school. But for now, may you remember that you are the church, we are the church together. More than a building, more than a single denomination, all of us from our belief, from our faith, from our call to love others, and to be the hands and feet of Christ for a world that is in need. Go forth in peace. Amen. <laughs>